Okay, I think we are about ready. Sorry for that delay. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for stopping by. Two weeks ago, I posted the first in what will hopefully be many Rivendell ciphers. And today we, really the computer, will randomly select the name of one of the folks who correctly decoded the cipher, fully answered the question, and sent the answer to me at rivendellcoins at gmail.com. So, but first, let's talk a little bit about the cipher itself and what sort of information was required to solve it. A few folks mentioned that they didn't know quite how to tackle it, while others said they noticed a clue right away that gave them a hint. And that is how ciphers sometimes work. You sometimes see something that leads you in the right direction or hopefully in the right direction. So here is the cipher that you would have downloaded from the link on the previous Cypher video. And this Cypher is based on what I think is one of the most interesting spy stories in the Revolutionary War. And one important clue appears at the bottom right of the Cypher where you see the S. Culper. Uh, S. Culper, or Samuel Culper, was the code name of a spy during the Revolutionary War. Actually, it was a code name for two spies. There was a Samuel Culper Jr and a Samuel Culper Sr. And this spy ring was uh, very important. It was really important to the American cause during the Revolutionary War because in the fall of 1776, British forces occupied New York City and set up their military headquarters there. New York was the most populated and one of the most prosperous cities in America at that time. And the capture of New York was important to the British because uh, that city served as a sort of wedge between New England and the Middle Atlantic and the southern states. So with New York under its control, the British forces uh, possessed a central location from which it could attack and, it was hoped, defeat the Continental Army and bring the rebellion to an end. George Washington also realized New York's strategic importance and knew that it was crucial for him to receive intelligence on the strength and on the movements of the British Army and Navy that was in and around that city. So he appointed Major Benjamin Talmadge, he's the one on the left, to be the head of a spy ring, which Washington named the Culper Ring. The name Culper is a shortened uh, version of Culpeper, which is a county in northern Virginia. And Benjamin Talmadge, whose code name was John Bolton, his name also appears on the cipher, was a major in the Second Continental Light Dragoons. Dragoons were mounted infantry that could move really swiftly along the field. Talmadge was a Yale graduate, as was his classmate, Nathan Hale, Nathan Hale, a lieutenant in the Continental Army, who was hanged by the British in 1776 for spying. Now, after the deaths of Nathan Hale and other soldier spies, Washington and Talmadge decided it was too dangerous to have military personnel sneak into New York City to gather intelligence, which was the way spying tended to be done back then. They thought it was dangerous because the British and the Loyalists in New York City by this time were increasingly suspicious of strangers, particularly strangers who seemed to be asking a lot of questions about the British forces. The British by that time had also established a network of spies in New York City of their own, and their job was to identify anybody who was possibly an enemy of the crown. So the Culper Ring recruited civilians who were already living and working in and around New York City. The idea was that these individuals would have a legitimate reason to be in the city and would not draw as much suspicion. And with that, the Culper Ring was formed. Civilians who were sympathetic to independence from Great Britain volunteered to gather military intelligence about the British and would forward that information to Benjamin Talmadge, who in turn would forward the information to George Washington. Now, the Culper Ring used different methods to convey their messages, including writing uh, secret messages in invisible ink between the lines of ordinary letters. They did so by embedding secret codes in Loyalist newspapers in New York, and by using a code book designed by Talmadge that used seemingly random numbers to represent words. So there's an example of it. The information that the spies would gather uh, would be written using this sort of numerical code. And that way, if the message was ever inter intercepted by the British, it would be next to impossible to decipher it without having the code book, which was never kept on the spy, while he or she, and there is evidence there was at least one female spy in the culpering, while he or she was delivering the coded message. 
Now, two of the most prominent spies in the Culper spy ring were Robert Townsend and Abraham Woodhull. Woodhull's code name was Samuel Culper Jr., and Townsend's code name was Samuel Culper Sr. So that's the Culper connection. Uh, Woodhull was a farmer who lived on Long Island, and as a farmer, he would often convey merchandise from his farm on Long Island to the markets in New York City. Woodhall also had a sister who lived in New York City and who owned a boarding house where British officers were often barracks. So uh, that added to Woodhall's intelligence gathering capabilities. And Townsend was a New York City merchant who was an acquaintance of Woodhall, and he agreed to join Woodhall in the Culpa Ring. And as a resident of New York City, Townsend was fairly well known to the locals and was able to travel freely throughout the area without suspicion. Now, as far as the route, the messages that the spies, uh, like Woodhull and Townsend, uh, would, would take when they coded the messages, they would carry the messages out of New York to areas that were outside of British control. And in this case, the messages were carried to Setauket, a town on the north coast of Long Island, where Woodhull and his family lived. And in Setauket, another man named Caleb Brewster, who was an officer in the Continental Army and part of the spy ring, he was also an experienced sailor, and he would carry the messages across Long Island Sound from Setauket to Fairfield, Connecticut, where they were given to Benjamin Talmadge. That's where his headquarters was. And Talmadge would then have his dragoons quickly relay the messages to George Washington's headquarters in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or Delaware or in the Hudson River Valley in New York. And likewise, any messages or directives from General Washington's camp could be sent to Talmadge in Connecticut, collected there by Caleb Brewster, delivered back across Long Island Sound to the network of spies on Long Island through Setauken. So that was the path they took. Now, uh, as far as what the spy ring did, uh, it's the Culper spy ring is credited with gathering some very important intelligence for the American cause. Among the intelligence gathered by the Culper spy ring was evidence that Benedict Arnold was spying for the British, and reports of a British plan to move troops and ships to Newport, Rhode Island, in an effort to ambush the newly arrived French army and navy before they had a chance to, dis to disembark and to organize. The Culper spy ring also uncovered uh, a British plan to undermine the American economy. The British plan was to print and distribute large amounts of counterfeit continental currency. And the discovery of this plan prompted Congress to recall the existing continental currency before the, uh, before the counterfeit currency would arrive in the United States. It's also said that the Culpa Ring uncovered a British plot to capture George Washington as he traveled along the Hudson River Valley to meet with French General Rochambeau, but historians are not as convinced of that story. Now, apart from the people who organized uh, and participated in the Culper spy ring, there was really little information known about the identity of the members, even among the spies themselves. And that was because the names of the spies were kept in the strictest secrecy by George Washington and Benjamin Talmadge in case the spy ring was ever infiltrated. And after the war, the Culper spy ring was disbanded and the members returned to their normal lives as United States citizens. And their roles in the Culper spy ring over time were somewhat obscured. However, in the 1930s, historians uh, began piecing together documents from the Revolutionary War and uncovered even more details about the Culper spy ring, including the names of one of the name of one of its most prominent members, Robert Townsend. So, if it hadn't been for the preservation of those early documents and the work of historians 150 years after the Revolutionary War ended, the Culper spy ring would have remained as mysterious now as it did in the 1770s. All right, let's go to the cipher itself. There it is again. Now, I mentioned one of the methods that was used by the Culper spy ring was a code book. So if you attempted the cipher, you hopefully noticed the names John Bolton and S. Culper. Doing a bit of research on those two names hopefully would have led you to information about the Culper spy ring and the code book. And let's see, here is a... Here's a page. The codebook can be found on different websites, including the Mont Vernon website, where you can download the scans of the original codebook as a PDF. And here's a section of a page from one of the codebooks, and I believe this is George Washington's copy of the codebook. And by looking at these numbers and the corresponding word or words, you would have deciphered a message, which read... 
Name of the Great Battle in Virginia, September to October, 1781. Now, in the code book, individual numbers corresponded to lowercase letters. So these letters appear at the end of the cipher, and that's the year 1781. And the answer to the question is the battle, or the Siege of Yorktown in which British General Cornwallis surrendered to the Continental Army, and that surrender effectively marked the end of the Revolutionary War. Uh, the war officially ended two years later in 1783 with the signing of the Treaty of Paris. All right, now as far as the code and solving it, we had eight people who successfully deciphered the message and sent me the complete answer to the question. And let's see, the correct answers were submitted by these eight individuals. We had a couple of people who got it partially, but I said in the original video that the answer, in fairness to everyone, needed to be complete. And as far as the prize, that is it. A set of silver, well, three silver coins and a buffalo nickel and a steel wheat cent. And this is the appreciation prize, and please remember, this is given solely by me. YouTube has no, affi no affiliation at all with the prize or with the selection of the recipient. And what we're going to do, this is what I <laughs> it was the cause of the delay. We're going to randomly select one of these individuals using random.org. Hopefully you see that website on the screen. And uh, let's see. You probably said you got it right, but you, you did answer it. You you decoded the message and you told me the answer to the... So you did answer it. All right, so hopefully you do see this screen. And I'm going to change. We have eight possible entries. It's there, great, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, I, ha I had it on OBS, but it was <laughs> kind of off to the side, so I had to, I was centering it at the last minute. Okay, so we will randomly select one of these individuals, uh, and let's generate a number. The randomly generated number is number six, and that means Jess Spitfire. <laughs> Congratulations, Jess Spitfire. Uh, please send me your mailing address to rivendellcoins at gmail.com and I will send this set of coins to you. So congratulations, and congratulations for everybody who entered and got the answer. All right, there you have it. I really enjoyed putting together this cipher, and I would like to create others. If you did not have a chance to solve this cipher, then keep an eye out on this channel. I hope to have another cipher ready towards the end of August, maybe the beginning of September. And thanks again, everyone, for watching. I hope you had a, have a wonderful day and keep learning something new.